Welcome to part 11 of my guide to video game history. In this episode I want to go back to the 8-bit home computer market and cover the heyday of the home gaming world. And what a bumper special episode this is going to be. There's so much that happened in this period that this episode is going to be a big one. So hold on to your joysticks as I take you through a ride through the 8-bit world. To begin with, let's go back to 1982 and discuss some of the other home computer hopefuls that didn't make it into the previous episodes. Previously, we saw how the Spectrum, Commodore 64, Amstrad and BBC dominated the market, but there was another machine that was on the fringes from August 1982, called the Dragon 32. It was built by Dragon Data from Swansea in Wales, and it was a clone of the Tandy Colour computer that was rushed to market to catch the 1982 buying boom. The Dragon sold for £175, the same as the Spectrum 48K, model. It may have only had 32k RAM, but it did at least have a proper keyboard and Microsoft Basic. But it was based on old technology and it showed, so sadly it never really stood a chance. Also released was the Oric 1 by Tangerine Computer Systems, but this also failed to make any inroads. Acorn also came out this year with the Acorn Electron, which was a much cheaper variant than the BBC home computer. It was intended to make inroads into the Spectrum market. But despite all these efforts in the UK, it really was just the Spectrum. Therefore, loads of Spectrum magazines sprung up with in-depth text-heavy articles and computer-listed programs for users to type in. Most notable was Sinclair User, released in April this year, but there were other classics such as Sinclair Programs and ZX Computing. In all of these magazines, kids could gain an insight on how to write games for their new machine. Often the type-in programs wouldn't work, but then that was part of the puzzle to work out what misprint the magazine had done which had caused the game to fail. In 1983, there were some real classics to be played. Bruderbund came out this year with Load Runner by Douglas E. Smith. In the game, you played a chap who must collect all the gold whilst digging holes to trap the enemy. First released on the Apple II, it was quickly converted to multiple formats, including a version for the arcade in 1984, which we're showing here. On the Spectrum in 1983, there was a brilliant motorbike game called 3D Death Chain by Micromega. It had you hurtling on a bike in a forest with a gun to blast fellow bikers and the occasional helicopter. The game may have been simple but it was great fun with an amazing sense of speed. This year also in 1983 would be the year that Clive Sinclair would be knighted for his contributions to Britain and so forevermore would be known as Sir Clive. In 1984 would also start to bring some of the first famous game publishers for the 8-bit market who would start up these companies to frantically release games to catch part of the new home computer a boom. First, there was US Gold, based in the UK in Birmingham. It started when Jeff Brown, a maths teacher, who had originally fallen into the world of distribution of US games. He did this by buying a US magazine called Compute for his newly acquired Atari 800 machine, and he decided to order a few of the games that were reviewed in the magazine. He was blown away by the quality of such titles as Galactic Chase. To him, it seemed so much better than most of the UK games being released at the time. So Jeff decided to show them to his store manager in Curry's, lying to him, saying that he had exclusive rights to distribute the game in the UK. Curry's ordered some games from him, and in turn he ordered them from the US. He was now a distributor of video games. His company, Centersoft Distribution, was doing well, so much so that he gave up being a teacher and went into the business full time. By now, Jeff was making trips to the US and meeting American firms and saw a game there called Beachhead for the Commodore 64. He loved it and arranged for rights to not only distribute it but 
publish the game in the UK. He had now become a publisher, and all he needed now was a new name for the publishing division. He chose the name US Gold, as that's what it was essentially, the best US software, and he would go on to huge success, bringing the UK such American classics as Impossible Mission, Raid Over Moscow, and California Games. Delights that we could have missed out on were it not for a maths teacher in Warsaw. US Gold wasn't just about US talent either. They would be instrumental in cultivating UK talent, with them being one of the first companies to work with Probe, and also helping out our next publisher find its feet by helping them finance their next game. That publisher was in 1984 where Ian Stewart and Kevin Norburn started up a little computer shop in Carver Street in Sheffield in the UK called Just Micro. Having started the computer shop they decided to also want to go into game development and publishing. They'd come across a fantastic game written by Peter Harrop called Wanted Monty Mole and they needed a way to finance the publishing of the game. Speaking to Jeff at US Gold he loved the game and he agreed to buy shares in their new company to help them finance it. With the money now at hand, they just needed a name for their new company and they chose the name Gremlin Graphics. Ah, Monty Mole, now one of the great forgotten video game characters in today's world. In his first outing, Wanted Monty Mole, he played a miner, who was a mole who must go around the mine collecting coal to put in a bucket to overthrow the evil Arthur Scargill because of the miners' strike. This idea of linking the game to the real miners' strike happening at the time, and even including a caricature of the leader of the miners, Arthur Scargill, in the game, gave the game loads of free advertising, even getting itself a spot on the News of Ten about it. The game itself may have been criticised at the time for being a Manic Miner clone, but for the gamer public, having another Manic Miner game was not such a bad thing. Another early game written for Gremlin in 1984 was the brilliant Percy the Potty Pigeon, which helped kick-start Anthony Crowler's career. The game had you play a pigeon where you had to make a nest, avoiding the hazards that stood in your way. But in the home computing publishing, there was one which was the daddy of them all, called Ocean Software. It was set up by two Liverpudlians, David Ward and his partner John Woods and they based the offices in Manchester and it quickly became the electronic arts of its day recruiting premier staff from all over the UK to write its games and helping other third party companies such as Sensible Software, Denton Designs and Digital Image Designs in publishing their games. Ocean became synonymous with its licensed games and arcade conversions, and it was in 1984 that year that they would catapult them into the Premier League of Publishers, with the game such as Hunchback, written by Century Electronics. In the game you played Quasimodo, who must make his way across the castle ramparts to ring his bell. The game was a massive success for Ocean, with it becoming a massive hit, even making its way into the arcades as the version being shown now. John Rittman, who had joined Ocean this year, would release Match Day, finally answering the prayers of every spectrum owning schoolboy in that having a decent football game to compare to international soccer on the Commodore 64. Ocean would also bring its first licensed game, which was called Daily Thompson's Decathlon. The game shamefully aped Konami's track and field, but was great fun all the same. It would also be the game that would make joystick manufacturers smile when the game's infamous frantic joystick waggling required in the game would destroy many a joystick. It would be in 1984 that would see the rise of the Gamer magazine, when Roger Keane, Oliver Frey and Franco Frey would put together a new games magazine for the Spectrum that they themselves wanted to read. Called Crash, it would replace the black and white text-heavy articles and replace them with loads of down-to-earth game reviews, literally written by school children. The magazine would be a massive success, with the kid readers really finding a common affinity to the writing style and no-nonsense game reviews. 
Also, Oliver Frey's fantastic artwork for the mag made it all seem so exciting and really captured the reader's imagination. Well, that's part A. Please go on to part B.